What do you get when you plant a tree and slay a beast? A bloody amazing city, that's what. I'm Christian Gilliam for The Ancient Project, bringing you a special episode for the rise and fall of Athens. We're looking at the early history of the city of Athens, specifically how and when it was founded. And this is no easy feat. The evidence and data for this period is a bit murky. We know some things through archaeological findings and some ancient literary sources. But as per usual with ancient Greece, there is a large body of mythical knowledge explaining the origins of Athens. This might not really portray the truth, but the myth still holds a significant echo of historical reality. In this episode, we'll descend into the foundation myth and listen for that echo. It all starts with a goddess who was born not out of the womb of her mother, but out of the head of her father. Her name is Athena. The account of Athena touted by the classical Athenians is based largely on the account offered by the poet Hesiod. He composed a theognid, that's a poem on the origins of the gods. To Hesiod, Athena is the daughter of Zeus. Thanks to a combination of high art and caricature, most of us think of Zeus as a big toned fella, adorned with white flowing robes, long white hair, and a Santa-like beard, and a menacing brow. His weapon of choice, the lightning bolt, of course. Anyway, Zeus married the goddess Metis, the divine personification of wisdom. By most accounts, this is his first marriage, Fearing the power a child with his strength and Metis' intelligence might possess, Zeus resolves to eat the pregnant Metis. Metis dies after being eaten by Zeus. Zeus moves on, sleeps around, marrying several other goddesses before taking Hera as his third and final wife. We'll cover this rather problematic love life in a different episode. On some accounts, such as we find in Homer's hymn to Athena, Zeus gave birth to Athena himself, meaning Metis had no part in it. Aeschylus, the first true Judean, has Athena say in his play The Euimenides, no mother gave birth to me. Then how did Athena enter this world? Well, shortly after his marriage to Hera, Zeus experiences a splitting headache, literally. By some accounts, Zeus orders his son Hephaestus, the lame god of metalwork, to smash his head open with an ax, hoping this would relieve the pain. Well, that's how it is reported by Pindar, the classical lyric poet famous for writing on and praising Olympic champions. When by Hephaestus' art and a stroke of his bronze-forged axe, Athena sprang from the top of her father's head, yelling her monstrous war cry, and heaven shuddered at her and Mother Earth. I have no idea how anyone thinks smashing their head would relieve a headache, but there you go. Other sources point that Hephaestus was born after the birth of Athena, and that maybe Prometheus, the god famed for giving fire to humans in defiance of Zeus, maybe he yielded the axe. In any case, Athena is purely of Zeus's making. Now, some scholars believe this reflects a certain importance to the city of Athens' self-identity. Namely, that their patron goddess was, though female, no regular goddess. She is motherless, powerful as a result, purely of male origin, and so of manly capability. She is born mature, fully armoured, and warlike. This is highly unique, for the Greek world at least, to be manly is virtue, to be a woman, vice. No wonder Athena had to be made manly. So, Athena jumps from a crack in Zeus's skull. This is the moment represented on the east pediment of the Parthenon at the top of the Acropolis. The scene is witnessed by the Olympian gods who crowd around the spectacle in awe. Now this last detail of the pediment comes from Homer's hymn to Athena, as he puts it, and I quote, golden armor clothed, it was glistening, warlike, all the gods who saw her were overcome with awe. So how did Athena become the patron goddess of a city? It was not common practice in ancient Greece to name a city after a god. So a story was created to explain this. This story starts with Kekrops, the mythical first king of Athens, born of the earth, half man, half serpent, joined into one. He named the land, known as Acte in the earlier days, Kekropia after himself, the humble fella he was. According to the ancient Greek scholar Apollodorus, it is during this period that the gods decide to take possession of cities. Poseidon, the brother of Zeus and the god of the sea, is the first to come to Cracropia. He strikes a blow in the middle of the Acropolis with his trident, causing the sea to appear as a flowing stream. Athena comes after Poseidon and plants an olive tree. Zeus separates the competing gods and appoints judges to decide the case. 
In some versions, the judge is Kekrops himself. For Apollodorus, it is the fellow gods of Olympus. The gods, or whoever, rule in Athena's favour. See, the domesticated olive tree she plants is said to be the first of its kind and presents to Cecropia a gift more worthy and in need than undrinkable seawater. An olive tree stands on the Acropolis to this day and was believed during the classical period to be the very tree that Athena planted. Some still think it is the same tree from the Persian invasion over 2,000 years ago, which unfortunately is highly unlikely. On another account, not as common in the classical period, of course, it is said that the goddess gets her name from the city. This has been widely accepted by contemporary scholars as the most likely explanation. Indeed, Athena, or Athene, or Athenae, all variations of the same word, is plural. This makes little sense for a name, but pluralizing was a common Bronze Age practice for the naming of cities. Mykini, for example, had a goddess named after the city called, well, Mykini. What's more, the name Athenae appears to be pre-Greek in origin, for it contains the morpheme Anne. She may have been a goddess of the pre-Greeks, who some scholars believe had a matriarchal society with little to no male deities. That is, until the first Greek speakers arrived on the scene in the Bronze Age, with their phallocentric Zeus, who is assumed to be a variation of the first Indo-European deity. But we don't have enough data to paint a full picture of this early history of Athens and its naming. Again, myth comes to the fore. But that will be covered in our next video on the foundation of ancient Athens. We started this project because we believe we can improve the way history is told on YouTube. Join us for more videos on ancient Athens, history and philosophy. And if you really want to help us out, consider joining our Patreon community. We have one tier for all that translates into about a cup of coffee a week. No, a month, even better. And it does come with some perks. So be sure to check it out and thumbs up and all that stuff. Ring the bell, ding dong and whatever else. I will see you in the next episode, I hope. Yasses. Thank you.